This evening we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. What I'd like to do is back up to verse 1 in chapter 5 of Matthew and uh, begin uh, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, but um, we're going to be looking specifically at verses 14 through 16. Uh, this is what uh, we read. Beginning in verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now again, we're not going to focus on the things that we saw earlier in this chapter, what we call the Beatitudes. Um, really what Jesus is saying here is not blessed are you if you do these things, but blessed are you if these things are actually already a part of your character because they can only be that way through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. By trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, by having the Spirit of God dwelling in you, He works these graces in you. But I do want to just mention in passing that these graces go into what it means to shine as lights in the world. These are some of those characteristics, some of those qualities, some of those uh, Christ-like qualities that the Spirit of God is working in you to make you a witness of Him. But now let me just back up and say this morning, we were looking again at the fact that, that John was drawing our attention to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to see who Jesus really is. Jesus is not merely a creature. Yes, he is man, but he's not merely a man. He's not just a good man, as liberals believe. Uh, not just one of the greatest prophets who have ever lived, as uh, Islam believes. He's not just a God, as Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And he isn't just one God among three gods or among many gods, as Mormons believe. He is the God. He is the God of creation. He is the eternal God. He is the one we saw this morning, John says, who has life in himself. And he is the one whose life is the light of men. Jesus, as God, is basically the source of all life. He's the one who makes you alive. That's why you are a living being and not just a mound of dust. You know, apart from God's uh, grace, the life that he has imparted to us, that is that Jesus has given to us, that's all we would be. And when the spirit of life departs from us, we will return to the dust. Uh, Jesus is also the one who gives you spiritual life. If you're a believer here this evening and that's why, presumably, you're here wanting to please God, wanting to worship Him, rather than being out there with the rest of the world trying to please yourself. Jesus is spiritual life, and He gives that to whom He wills. Uh, Jesus, we saw this morning, is the source of all light. He's the one who gave you a mind when He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and He became a living being. 
He gave him a rational mind and the ability to discover truth. Jesus is the one who reveals the truth that God exists through nature and the one who tells us about God and his plan of redemption through the word. Jesus is the one who illumines your minds and your hearts by his Holy Spirit to see the beauty of his truth so that you might desire it, that you might receive it, and that you might live, that you might receive his life. John is emphasizing the fact that Jesus is life and he is light. Jesus is God. Now this evening I thought I might follow up on that particular theme. I think I told you that I want to try to um, kind of find some applicational devotional things from the morning sermon and maybe develop them a little bit more in the evening. And I thought perhaps we could use this evening to look at how that truth that Jesus is light in life should impact your own life. Now that you're in the Lord Jesus Christ, what does Jesus say is true about you. Uh, now that you're in Christ, what is it that Jesus wants you to do in light of what he is? Well, he says to you in our text this evening that now you are light. You are the light of this world. And he tells you to shine that light so that others may find his life, even as you have found it in him. Now, since this, what Jesus calls us to do, at least the second part of it, requires uh, some measure of effort on your part and mine in order to, to do this, we're also going to look at how it is you can shine that light that the Lord has given to you more brightly. And as believers, that's what we want to do. Now, first of all, Jesus says that you are light. He says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. Uh, Paul picks up on this theme also in Ephesians 5, 8, and this, he says there, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Uh, in Ephesians 2, he tells us that you, you know, we all formerly walked according to the course of this world. We were the children of wrath even as the rest, but God had mercy upon you. Now that you are a believer, God has given to you a different kind of life and one that sets you apart from the people of this world. Jesus has given you his life. Uh, his Holy Spirit has raised you from the dead and his life now shines through you. Basically, you reflect the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I've already drawn your attention to this numerous occasions, but I do want to emphasize again that this is what Peter is referring to when he says that you share in God's nature. And the only reason I need to emphasize that is because of the number of people who actually misinterpret that and believe that somehow we are becoming gods. We are not becoming gods. We don't share in his divine nature in the sense that we share in his being or his power or any of what we call the, the attributes of God, the incommunicable attributes, but rather we share in those that are communicable, his holiness. Uh, Peter writes in 2 Peter verses, or chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lusts. You see, you were formerly darkness, as Paul said. You were in this, this corrupted state in the world, but you have escaped it through the knowledge of him who called us, that is, through the knowledge of Christ you are now partakers of the divine nature. You are light in the Lord. Now again, going back to our text, I do want you to see that Jesus is not here in this first part issuing you a command. He isn't saying, become the light of the world. I command you to be the light of the world. But rather, he's stating a fact that in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are in him, if you are trusting him, you are the light of the world. 
Now, we do know that Jesus is the true light. We saw that this morning. The true light has passed into the heavens. That's where Jesus is, seated at the right hand of God. But he has made provision to continue the shining of his light in the world through you. You are the light of the world. And so secondly, being his lights, Jesus wants you to, uh, not surprisingly, shine the light that he has given to you. He says in our passage, and again in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus has made you light and he wants you to shine that light. Now, what is the light that he's given to you? What is this light that you're supposed to shine? Well, I think it can really be wrapped up in two things. First of all, it is the light of a changed nature, of a changed character. The light of a life that is visibly different from that of the world. Again, you were darkness, now you're light. You were formerly corrupt, but now you're partakers of the divine nature. That should be visible in your life. Now, you're not going to be able to shine and people aren't going to be able to see uh, any difference unless you actually are different, unless you actually stand out. And that's exactly what the Lord is calling you to do. I already told you in Ephesians 5, 8, uh, Paul tells us what we were before and what we are now and he goes on to tell us what it is therefore we should do. Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 13. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. For all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. So to walk, as it were, in the light, you need to be different. You need to walk, as John puts it in 1 John 1, 7, with God in the light. As Paul puts it here, you need to live as children of light, as God's children, as those who share his nature. What that means is that you need to study God's word to learn what is pleasing to him and do what he says. You need to understand what it is that God hates, what the people of the world are doing that he hates and you need, instead of doing what the people of the world are doing along with them, you need not to do those things, you need to avoid them. And he says, rather, even expose them. Let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works. Uh, shine your light in such a way by way of personal example as well as by way of words. Expose the sins that are in the world. In other words, don't blend in with them, but stand out from them and as light, shine your light towards them and expose the sins they're involved in. Now, let me just point out that you are called to do this. I'm called to do this, but in order to do this effectively, you've got to do it out of love because if you do it in, a, in, a, well, in, in the way the Pharisees did it, pulling in your skirts and disdaining uh, the sinners around you and crying out unclean to people who walk by you, that's not what the Lord wants you to do. What he wants you to do is, is come to them in gentleness, come to them in love, from a genuine desire to do them good, to see them repent, knowing where their sins are going to lead them. Their sins are going to lead them to judgment. And so out of compassion and mercy and a desire to see them saved, remember that every person living today is a soul capable of salvation. And they may very well be one that the Lord is going to make a brother and sister, but they won't, he won't do it unless we share the gospel, unless we're willing to stand out, unless we're willing to tell them 
unless we're willing to call them to repentance or point out what it is they're doing wrong and try to get them to turn, try to get them to amend, try to get them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first way we are to shine as lights is by way of example and, of course, by that example to encourage people to turn from their sins. But the second way, of course, I've already included in the first, so I'll just say it briefly, we do need to communicate the gospel to them, okay? Follow up your example with the truth, with the gospel. Jesus has commissioned you to bring his gospel to everyone that you know. We often pray for people and we ask that God would save them, but do we ever think about the fact that they need to hear the gospel and since we know them and we have a relationship with them, that we can communicate it to them and that the Lord has actually called us to do that very thing. Jesus says to his church in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That certainly means everybody you know and people even you don't. And we can do it in a variety of ways, even inviting them to watch a movie and to hear the gospel, inviting them to a service where they're going to hear the gospel. This truth of the gospel, which is combined with a a godly life, you know, the testimony of a changed life, one that is different from the world, is a very powerful light. It's what God uses to change lives, to save the lost. And so the Lord says that you are light, you are the light of the world. And he says to you that you are to shine that light in the darkness so that men may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. Remember what makes that light most powerful, and we're going to see that right now, is love. So now finally, if Jesus has made you light and he calls you to shine that light, what can you do to shine it more brightly? Well, you can only do it by becoming more like Jesus. And how can you do that? Well, first of all, you need to realize that it is a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of just simply you know, studying the Word of God and then seeking to mimic what Jesus did. Because if all you're doing is parroting Jesus, that's not going to have the effect that God wants it to have. You need to have the heart of Jesus. You must love him and really want to be like him in loving other people if you ever have any hope of shining this light more brightly. I mean, when we really look into the life of Jesus, we do need to understand there was a reason why he was the way that he was. And his reason is because he loved his Father and he wanted to glorify him. And that's why he lived the kind of life that he lived. It was out of love for the Father in John 14, 31. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Jesus shows his love through his obedience. If you are to shine his lights in the world by obeying uh, the Lord, by living the kind of life he calls you to live, by communicating the gospel, you must love him more. You see, you have to be driven from the inside. You have to be changed from the inside out. It's exactly what Jesus told his disciples in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I mean, that's how we know we love Jesus. But we need to understand that it's also the, the measure, as it were, of our love. To the degree that you love him, to that degree you will obey him. And to that degree you will shine as lights in the world. Ever wondered why it is that Jesus asked Peter... Uh, these questions before he told him to tend his sheep. Uh, he asked him whether or not he loved him and how great that love was for him. In John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Now, we know that Peter is only going to do this to the degree that he actually loves Jesus Christ. And Jesus was challenging him to, you know, as to how much he did love him. And I think you've probably heard on numerous occasions that the first two times Jesus asks him the question, he says, do you love me with this supreme love, this agape love? And Peter answers with a lesser love. Uh, Jesus, you know that I have a brotherly love for you. And Jesus, the second time, do you, do you love me supremely? And Peter says, you know that I have a brotherly love for you. And then this third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you really have a brotherly love for me? He lowers the degree of love down to that level. And Peter was grieved because he said the third time, do you have a brotherly affection for me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I have this brotherly affection for you. Well, you know, it, it would have been better if Peter, of course, could have actually owned up to this supreme love, but Jesus was willing to use even the love that he had. But it was important that he loved the Lord if he was going to do what the Lord had called him to do. Love was the reason why Paul gave himself to the Lord in the way that he did and went through so many things, even being willing to lay down his life for the Lord and actually doing so. And, of course, he says we all need to have that kind of love. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 15. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, Therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The only way you can do that is by loving Jesus Christ. So if you would shine more brightly for Jesus, you do have to have this love in your heart for him. As a matter of fact, you need to love him more than anything or anyone else. Let me point out to you again what Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 37 through 39, as he's preparing to send his disciples out to preach the gospel. How are they going to be able to do that? I mean, he's sending them out to, to shine the light. How are they going to shine if their hearts are bogged down with other loves, something they love more than Jesus? He says this, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says we have to be willing to give up everything, even our own lives, to follow after him. In other words, we need to love him more because whatever you love the most... That is what you are going to devote your life to. And if what you love is anything other than Him, anything other than Jesus, you're not going to be able to do what the Lord calls you to do. You're not going to have a light to shine. That thing will cripple you. You've got to let it go, and you've got to love Him more than anything else. Well, that brings us to the second question. How can you love Jesus this much? as much as he calls you to love him. Well, obviously, you can't do it in your own strength. This love has to begin with him. He is the one who must give you this love. And in order to do that, you have to come to him. If you haven't come to him, if you haven't trusted him, if you haven't received his life, that's where you need to begin. That's where you need to start. Turn from your sins and trust in him because only he can change your heart. But if you have already come to him, you do need to understand that the strength of your love depends largely on you. There are things that you can do to make this love grow, and there are things you can do to weaken this love. You need to stay away from the things that weaken it, and those things are all sin. And you need to do the things that will strengthen it and make it grow the means that God has given to you. Read the Bible. Read it in faith. Pray in faith. Believe it. Apply it. Worship. Fellowship with other believers. Come to the Lord's table. 
The Spirit uses these things to strengthen you. Now, as, you're, as, as, you're, as you become spiritually stronger by using these means, it's going to strengthen a particular faculty that God has given to you that is very important, and that is faith. You see, as your strength is, or as your faith is strengthened, then you will see the, the Word of God, the truth of God, in the way you need to see it. You need to see it clearly. I think sometimes the things we read don't have very much impact in our lives because we don't strongly believe these things to be true. But the stronger your faith is, the more these things will appear as they are, and that is real. God really does exist. God's kingdom really does exist. There really is life after death. There really is a heaven, and there really is a hell. And there are people going to heaven, and there are people going to hell. It really does matter how you live. God really is going to use your efforts to bring other people to Him. And He really will reward you for what you do for Him. Now, if you don't believe these things are true, it's going to reflect in your life, isn't it? You will do little or nothing for Him. I mean, why would you lay yourself out for something you don't even believe to be true? But if you do believe them, your life is going to reflect that as well. The stronger your faith is, the more you will see these things as what they really are, real. And it will move you to live differently. But now as your strength is, or your faith, excuse me, is strengthened, there is one more thing that you will see more clearly. And something that perhaps above all the other things will help you to shine even more brightly in this world. And that is God's love for you and his love for mankind, but particularly his love for you. His love will strengthen your love. The more clearly you can see his love, the more you will actually love him. Now, Spurgeon writes this, and I think it's very insightful. It's from a sermon called Loving God Deeply. He says, if you would love God, do not look within you to see whether this grace or that be as it ought to be, but look to your God and read His eternal love, His boundless love, His costly love, which gave Christ for you. Then shall your love drink in fresh life and vigor. Now, I don't think that Spurgeon is telling us here that you shouldn't look at your life to see whether or not God's grace is there at all because that's the only way you can really know whether you really know Jesus Christ, whether you're genuinely saved. But if you want your love for Him to grow... You need to look to his love and you need to soak it in. You need to know that that love is for you. You need to see the, the immensity of that love and let it move your heart to love him even more. You see, it was this love that Jesus had for him that moved George Whitfield to put himself out in the Lord's service so unstintingly. If you read the biography of his life, you'll see. His whole life was about Christ. This is what he wrote. The love of Jesus is unfathomable. Oh, the height, the depth, the length and breadth of this love that brought the King of glory from his throne to die for such rebels as we are when we had acted so unkindly against him and deserved nothing but eternal damnation. It's the love of Christ that moved him. But you see, the only reason why Whitfield was able to see that love is because he had faith. He believed that what God said was true. He believed what the Bible actually said. It had an impact in his life, the kind of impact that it should have on each one of ours. It was really the desire to declare this love of Christ to, to others that moved Spurgeon to labor as he did. He writes in his sermon, Immeasurable Love. It has been my one and only business to set forth the love of God to men in Christ Jesus. I heard lately of an aged minister of whom it was said, whatever his text, he never failed to set forth God as love and Christ as the atonement for sin. I wish that much the same may be said of me. 
My heart's desire has been to sound forth as with a trumpet the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, if you want your love for God, if you want your love for the Father and for his son Jesus Christ to grow, you need to understand the love of God towards you. You need to understand what it is that he has done for you. You need to understand what you were apart from Jesus Christ, how you were helpless and in darkness and ignorance and on your way to hell, and you would have perished there everlastingly if God had not loved you and sent his son to die for you that you might have life. And then finally, as you've meditated on the love of God to the point where your love has, has grown to where the Lord wants it to be, uh, when you love him as you should, then God is going to help you shine that light to the world, shine that light to others as you seek to give him glory. I've already mentioned to you that passage that Hanani the prophet brought to King Asa. And because Asa had trusted in the king of Aram rather than in, in the Lord himself to deliver him from the king of Israel, he basically reproves him. He reproves him by telling him what he should be, but he knows by implication what he is not. This is what the Lord calls all of us to be. In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Now we know that God doesn't literally have to look through the world. He already knows exactly what is in each one of our hearts. He knows it from moment to moment. But when, you know, the question we need to ask is, what does he know about your heart? What does he see in your heart? Do you have a heart for him? Is your heart completely for him? Or do you have no love in your heart for him at all? Well, the Lord is looking for those who are completely devoted to him in order that he might use them. And if he sees that kind of heart in you, he's going to use you. And he's going to use you powerfully, as he did Peter, as he did Paul, as he did Whitfield, as he did Spurgeon, and really a host of others. So if you want to shine as the Lord calls you to this evening, you do need to turn from your sins and trust in Christ. You do need to use the means that God has given to you to strengthen your faith. And in that faith, you need to see the love of Christ towards you, the love of God in Christ, and meditate on that love until you love him most of all. And then you need to look to the Lord to use you because then you will be the kind of person that he is pleased to come alongside of and help. May the Lord grant that we may all be that kind of person in the way that the Lord has called us to. But let me again just remind you, it doesn't happen automatically. There is a lot of work involved in this, a lot of putting off your sins and putting the death and putting on Jesus Christ. We need to be about that business if we're going to fulfill what the Lord has called us to do in this world. So let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to be that kind of person.